if you would turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. We are making a much quicker time of our study in Philippians than we did in John. And Lord willing, the next letter that we will begin in January will be Ephesians, where we'll talk about our position in Christ and then our purpose in Christ. That's still a few weeks away. So unless the Lord changes it, which He's allowed to do, it's His church, He bought it. Philippians 3, this morning, verses 17 through 21, believers pressing on together in the Christ life. Would you bow with me as I pray? Father, as we now have our Bibles open, give us ears to hear. And Lord, make us ready to receive the word implanted, the word that has saved us, and now, Lord, you are sanctifying us. But if there be any among us this morning who do not know you, God, make their hearts tender. Save, we pray. And we know that you will complete the work that you began in your people. Even when we feel like we have failed that one big final time that's just too much. Pray that we will not um, go the wrong way with that as if it doesn't matter how we live, because it does matter. But may we rest not in our fleshly ability, but in yours, in your power, <clears throat> in your desire to do these things. I pray for my brothers elsewhere. I thank, uh, thank Brother Greg for praying for me this morning here, but I, I pray for brothers elsewhere who are preaching today. Lord, it is repetitious. I do this every week. Because I'm reminded every day and every week that I'm, I'm a weak man, but you're powerful. And Lord, we need your spirit to fill us. We need you, Lord, to meet with us. Help us now to behold you and to respond rightly. And may the fruit be very evident that we have for your glory and even our good, I pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to think of a person that you know or someone maybe that you knew. They've consistently followed Jesus and they set a very godly example. I'm not trying to take your mind to a place where now you're just going to be reminiscing or crying and thinking about this person or persons even for the rest of the sermon, but rather the drive of Paul's text. I have some very, very uh, precious thoughts on, on godly examples that I have watched. Some that are still here, some that are finally home. Um, so, consider now the importance of living the Christ life in such a way that you could call others humbly to imitate you. That one's hard. Because I'm always wondering about that line. I know I'm fidgeting with this earpiece, but it'll be fine. It's just my face, I'm sure. <clears throat> I'm always wondering, Lord, I want to live in such a way that I could call other believers to imitate me, but I'm also scared to death of stepping over into pride. Not, not that I'm absent or devoid of pride. <laughs> but I, I really get panicky because... You know, you never want to come across, you've heard me say it so many times, as a Pharisee, like, oh yeah, you should live like I live. You know, do you not just soak up my greatness? Obviously that's wrong. And that's not Paul's point. And sorry for this. I don't know what I've done. But then there's that very real biblical precept that the people whom God has saved should live by His Spirit's power, by His grace and in humility, to where we could say without pride or arrogance, I've walked before you in following Jesus. Just imitate what I did. No, I'm not perfect in it. But just imitate what, I, what you saw in me. And that's what Paul is able to do. He began the section of this letter or this section of the letter, with a warning to believers concerning religious phonies. And then he shifted to the example of his own life in following Jesus. Paul admits his own shortcomings, but then he presses on with diligence. 
And I, I do apologize if this is frustrating y'all. I think I know what's happened, but it's we're, we're good. We're good. Uh, give me just a second. There we go. It came out, out of the little thing on my neck. So we see in Paul a man who says, follow me, but I do have shortcomings. You see the balance there? Being able to call someone to imitate you doesn't mean I'm here. And I can never get out of step. And Paul has been clear on that. So we're going to look at some Christian necessities this morning. And I've got three, not because it's a rule, just because that's what we're doing. And this is going to start in verse 17. The Christian necessity of following the example of other godly believers. Look at verse 17 of Philippians 3. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. These are godly examples, not idols. And that's a real danger. I know that in my own life there are people that I have looked to, I've watched online, listened to their sermons, read their books, and I'm thankful for them. But I have to remember that these men are fellow sinners just like I am. And regardless of the size of church they pastor or how many books they've written, how many conferences they speak at, we can love them for being godly examples without worshiping them. And I remember in seminary, one of the professors said, um, he said, I'm tired of hearing, what did Piper say? He goes, I don't care. Don't worry, I'm going to fix this once and for all. He said, I don't care. Not that I don't like Piper, but I'm just tired of hearing Piper, Piper, Piper. And you know what Piper said? Piper said, I'm tired of hearing about Piper too. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of it. Okay, sorry y'all. I just can't do it today. It's really distracting me. I'll just talk louder. Is this microphone great? Is this one on? Yeah. Good. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And I do like that thing. It just got caught up on. So we can thank God for godly examples without worshiping them or acting as if they have no flaws. Justin Peters said something at G3 this year, and I was like, man, thank you, Justin. He was like, he said, it, it, I'm going to paraphrase, you know, talking about, I don't know you all. What was there, like 8,000 people there? He goes, but your pastor is the one who's praying for you weekly. Your pastors are the ones that know you by name. So, you know, you thank God for, for godly people in your lives without idolizing others. So in verse 14, Paul wrote about his own daily pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And now he calls for the Philippian believers to join in imitating him in doing this. Now, that phrase comes from one Greek word, and it's the word where we get our English word mime or mimic. Now, this is not talking about those weird people that the mime class. I can't stand those, those acts. I'm not the people. I don't know them. But that whole thing where they're doing all this and they won't talk, I'm like, that's the, to me, that's the creepy clown. <laughs> See, others of you are looking at Bozo, who I loved as a child and wanted to win the bicycle on the Bozo show. But, but the mime clowns are the ones I'm like, man, you should talk. Um, that's where we get this, this, the word though, from this phrase, join in imitating me. Philippians, here's what you know about me. You know that I'm a sinner. I've admitted that to you. You know that I'm not home. I've admitted that to you. But what you also have to remember is that when God called me to come to you, almost immediately we were imprisoned because I cast a demon out of a girl. It was in a jail cell in the very middle of the prison where Silas and I were in stocks and chains singing praises to God in the midnight hour to where when the doors opened as a result of a God-sent earthquake, the prisoners didn't run out, they ran in. How were we able to praise God in the midst of those circumstances? Because we consistently think on who Jesus is and what he's done. No, we are not perfect men. We are not idols to be worshipped. But we love our King. And we live by His grace daily, trying to set examples for others to follow. So do that. 
And notice something, though, about that phrase, join with me. I'm not saying put me on an elevated status where everyone be like Paul, everyone be like Paul. No. But look, Paul is a godly man, and he's calling us to step up here with me, and let's go forward. Remember the language last week of that walking in formation? That's really what Paul is doing. He's saying, come on up here with me, and let's go. Let's go forward. He tells them to keep their eyes on those who walk according to the example that they have witnessed in Paul and those who ministered with him. And you might take your minds back to Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. And he spoke of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Remember those two men? The examples that, that Paul gave there, how these men were concerned about the glory of Christ. They were concerned about the followers of Christ. These were good examples. And there would have been others. In fact, I know I'm jumping ahead here, but Lord willing, next Sunday we're going to get into chapter 4 where there's a very gentle form of church discipline because two ladies are at odds with one another and people are now picking sides. And these are godly women who think they're doing right and they're not. They're wrong. And that's one of the bad places to be is when you are convinced that you're right and the Lord says, no, you're not. But I feel right, but you're not. They were godly examples too. And there was just a, a faction of sorts that had to be dealt with. The Philippians had a good many examples to look to. So I would simply say this on following the example of other godly believers. Consider the believers who you could imitate in the Christ life. Again, I'm not asking you to take your mind away from Jesus and to romanticize and, and to get overly sentimental. But think of a person or persons whom you've seen Jesus in. It might even bring a tear to your eye. I know it did me when I was studying this. But you're, you're able to say, God, they'll never get worship from me because that, that is worthy of you and you only. But thank you for this person. Thank you for these people, Lord. Thank you for setting them before me. I remember one time a friend told me, and, and it still saddens my heart to think, but I'll just say this, their home life was nothing like the one I had growing up. My sister could tell you that the Winters family, we had our issues, but we loved each other. And we had a godly father and mother to lead the way. Imperfect, yes. Sinners, yes, but redeemed. But this friend who came to know me well and to know my family well said one time, Daryl, you don't know what you have. You really don't know what you have. And it wasn't just about having a dad in the home and a mom in the home, in the home and the dad loving the mommies. No. You, and, and my mom was quieter. I don't mean that she never prayed or anything. I'm just saying my dad was... was much more the extrovert would talk to anyone anywhere he said your dad is one of the godliest people I've ever known <coughs> so you don't know what you have and I am thankful for that and sad at the same time because I'm like Lord I know my dad wasn't perfect but he was a good example and I wish that every kid could grow up in a home where they knew that dad loves Jesus and mom loves Jesus and those are the examples that we should set I'm certainly not trying to compete with anyone, and I'm certainly not trying to wound anyone who would say, Daryl, I didn't have that either. But, but you're here, and you're following Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But consider those that you could imitate in your life as you press on toward the, the goal. And then consider your own life. Is it lived in such a way that others would do well by imitating you? And I thought about what that might look like because there are certain areas where I would say, yes, Lord, I wish people, or not that I wish y'all would be like me. I don't, <laughs> that came out wrong. Lord, I think that I set a good example here. By your grace, you've brought me to this point, but not here. Here, yes, not here. Here, we're getting there. Oh, we're a mile away or 10 miles away here. And then it, it just kind of hit me as I was reading this week in Galatians in the Spirit-filled life. 
and what Paul speaks of when he talks about walking by the Spirit rather than by the flesh. And you think of the fruit of the Spirit, there's several aspects love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self control. And I see some of that fruit in my life, and then there's times when I see a lack. But I, I feel like I can say this in confidence. I think that the membership of this church wants to walk godly in Christ Jesus to such a degree that in humility we could say, just follow me as I'm following Jesus. We'll get there. And we would also admit, we got a ways to go ourselves. <laughs> So a believer's life who is consistently showing the fruit of the Spirit is a believer to imitate. Now let's move to the second point, verses 18 and 19. Christian necessities, this one of detecting false sheep. We've already talked about false shepherds, and they're going to be a part of this group too, but I think this is even now talking about those who aren't in leadership positions, but they're in the congregation, but they're not truly born again think that they claim to know the Lord they just do not actually know him verse 18 for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you catch this phrase even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ their end is destruction their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things we're about to see a very big contrast in verses 20 and 21, but let's, let's rest here for a moment. In verse 18, Paul gives another reason as to why it is so important to join with him and other believers in pressing on toward Christ. Remember, Christ is the goal. It's not just a, a type of life or an idea, but no, we're, we're actually looking to Jesus. He's the goal. Not the things of Jesus, but Jesus himself. And sometimes we can get those confused and we like the things of Jesus. We like the words of Jesus. And we're not liking and loving Jesus as much as we're liking his things and other, other, other words. Paul calls to their minds the many times that he has warned them through the years about pretenders as it pertains to those who claim to follow the Lord. Now the intensity is more so here because Paul speaks of his present tears that flow as he writes. And for those of you who spend, you know, time with the Lord in His Word, and, and I'm not trying to be mean-spirited here, but you're not just like, hey, how many chapters do I have to read today? But you really, you open it and you're like, God, I want to hear from you. I want to behold you. I don't need a jolt. I want to see you. I want to hear from you. And you'll be reading. And... It'll be a text that you've read numerous times. But as you read it, it's like the goodness of God has just opened up even wider. Your heart becomes tender. Those tears begin to, to fall down your face. Lord, I've read this so many times. And it's as if he says, and it's always good, isn't it? Amen. But in this context... I think Paul is writing with specific individuals in mind. Yes, a group, but, it's, but specific individuals. People that he thought were brothers or sisters in Christ. Only to find out that there's no evidence to support those claims. It is very much likely that Paul is referring here to false Gentile converts, not, not Judaizers. He's dealt with the other. But this looks to be more about those even in Philippi who would have started or at least given the appearance of starting but they're not in Christ but they professed Daryl uh, I was there that day uh, boy they went to the altar and they were crying they recited a prayer where are they today well today yeah I don't I don't know that I want to really discuss today <coughs> So you want to you look back to something months, years, maybe even decades and just forget about the months, days, years, and decades in between? You can't do that. Or you shouldn't do that. So I think Paul is talking about Gentiles in the Philippian church, at least in a specific sense, 
who at least gave the appearance of being followers of Jesus. But not only are they not followers of Jesus, Paul says they're enemies of the cross. Could, could this be that they're like persecuting other believers? It could, but it doesn't have to mean that. Do you realize that when you're conceived, you're an enemy of the cross? Now, I know some people deny that, but in the womb, you are a sinner against God. No, no, you're, 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 you're in the womb. You're neutral. Oh, there is no neutral. Romans 3 doesn't say for most have sinned. Romans 5.12 doesn't say that death came to a lot of people. I know that's a very troubling reality. But we are the enemies of Christ from conception. When you can be an enemy of Christ, even in a passive position where you're not uh, persecuting believers, like beating them or even lying about them or slandering them, but you simply don't know Christ, you're his enemy. That's where Paul is going. I do want to give two notes on this, though. Sadly, it is, it is not uncommon for genuine believers in Jesus to consistently battle doubts as to whether or not they know him. Okay, Daryl, you just frightened me. Well, I hope I didn't. I know Paul didn't. But, but I, do I think I'm a believer, but I'm really an enemy of Christ? Well, hold on. Hold on. Can a genuine believer have doubts? Yes, unfortunately they can. You always go back to John the Baptist, the man that Jesus is of men born to women. There's none greater. And John who boldly preached that Jesus is the Christ in prison in a scenario that he didn't expect and was thinking like, wait, when the Messiah shows up, this stops happening, but it didn't. Why? Because he had a wrong view that, that Messiah was not just a geopolitical figure and the bigger enemy was sin, not Rome. And John said, are you the one? John had his doubts. But then Jesus comforted John. How? By taking him back to the Word. So can a genuine believer at times struggle with assurance? Yes. Sometimes that's on the believer because they're not pursuing Christ as they could and should. You know, I've, I've talked to people and I'll be like, well, tell me what's going on in your life. You know, how are things at church? Well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, what? Well, I'm not really attending. And you're wondering why you're doubting. Well, Daryl, salvation isn't about church attendance. I agree. But the people of God want to be with the people of God. <laughs> People of God want to worship together. I know that there are scenarios where people are imprisoned at times in other countries because they're persecuted, and those are isolated instances, not the normative pattern. But the normative pattern for the people whom God has saved is that they will want to be with other people whom God has saved, and they will want to sing together and pray together and hear the Word of God together. Those things will be there, and when you hold yourself back from that, it's no wonder that you're doubting and I'll just say it, a person who says, yeah, you know, you're right, but then they never want to come back. I, I don't think you have a salvation to doubt right there. So, so there's an instance. Being an enemy of the gospel is someone who has never repented and believed. But even those who have repented and believed sometimes find themselves doubting. Sometimes it's of their own doing. Sometimes it's just life scenarios where it's like, I think like John, like how did I end up here? I've been faithfully serving you and I'm in prison. What happened? But then I want to address what Paul has been addressing in the Corinthian congregation with the current division there. It is possible to wrongly assess a person as being an unbeliever because of the disagreements. Now, that's an extreme place to go, but it can happen. So we have to be very careful there. Because folks, let's, let's just face it. And I'm not saying that it's good. But we're going to have disagreements at times in the congregation. It, 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 it sadly will happen. Uh, remember that, that episode in Acts 15 with Paul and Barnabas? They disagreed. I don't think there was a sin issue there. They disagreed on whether or not John Mark should go. So they, they didn't come to a, a consensus opinion. So Paul takes Silas, goes this way. Barnabas takes John Mark and goes this way. And I think there's an agreement there. But there are going to be disagreements and differences. So just because someone differs with you doesn't mean you can say, Brother Greg, Brother Darrell, such and such is an unbeliever. They're an enemy, an enemy of the cross. Why do you think that? Because they don't agree with me on this. Settle down. Settle down. Your emotions are talking right now. 
So in this particular verse, verse 18, there is the very real reality of people who profess faith in Christ but are actually the enemies of Christ. And there are genuine believers who will sometimes struggle with assurance. And then there are genuine believers who will some, sometimes struggle with seeing another person as a brother or sister because of a present disagreement. So keep those things in mind. Now in verse 19, Paul tells the Philippians of what, it will, of what will happen to these enemies of the gospel and what ultimately reveals who they truly are. Look at there's four things here. Number one, their end is destruction. They cannot fool God. They might fool us, but they cannot fool Him. They will be under His wrath for eternity. Second of all, their God is their belly. Now, several commentators think that this is actually figurative. And this is not trying to, to get away from you know, having too much of an appetite for food. That definitely can be an idol. But the, the thinking is, is that it has to do more with sensual desires in a sexual sense. And when you look at Romans 1, what's one of the telltale signs that the judgment of God is on a society? That not only is sexual immorality being practiced, it's now getting hearty approval even by those who you know, would claim to know God. So that's, that's a reality. And we're seeing that in our day. I mean, how many people are now saying, oh, you can love Jesus and, you know, be homosexual or be transsexual or whatever or transgender or you can leave this wife for another one or whatever. And, hey, you know, just it's all about love. We're seeing that being embraced more and more and more. And some of you might be thinking, well, Daryl, I don't really hold to that. Yeah, talk to the younger generation. If you think that agenda isn't preached steadily and consistently, and the young, and that's where we're seeing it, and the teenagers are like, well, I don't see the problem, Dad. I don't see the problem, Mom. I mean, they're, this, this is my friend. They're kind and loving. Well, they're walking outside of God's boundaries. And you have to teach them how to differentiate. It says, third, they glory in their shame. Now, if the previous statement is about sexual, sensual desires, and I lean to think that it is, and then this statement looks to be about these people refusing to repent and not only showing open acceptance and celebration of that which God opposes, but then basically telling others, you have to do the same. Is that happening in our world right now? <laughs> yes. I sound like a broken record here, but, but for those of us in our 40s and 50s and above, we can remember just two decades or so ago with, hey, we're just asking for civil unions. It's like we're asking for marriage until you give us civil unions. And then we did. And it's like, well, you know, I mean, let's just take that next step. It's, it's not like we're asking the whole nation to endorse it until we get what we're asking for. And we gave. And we had state constitutions. Tennessee had a, sta had a, had a constitutional amendment that marriage is between one man and one woman. That got thrown out by the Supreme Court. Remember that? So it's not just, hey, let me be and we'll all be fine. It's now, and I'm demanding you to accept this and say that it is good. Yeah. They glory in their shame. And then fourth, Paul says their minds are set on earthly things. The mind of the unbeliever is on the here and the now does not think upon the things of God because it doesn't want to. It doesn't want to be confronted. When it goes to the Bible, it will pick and choose portions that seems to give approval to what they want. And they do not want to be confronted with anyone who could say, yeah, but that text doesn't rule out this text. So they shout loud. The main point in these statements is that people who live for themselves rather than submitting to Christ and being willing to suffer for Him reveal that they do not belong to Jesus even if they have professed to belong to Jesus. I'm not trying to be a killjoy and I'm certainly, certainly not trying to take away from when someone professes faith in Jesus and we say, well, Daryl, what do you do? I rejoice. And I think we should. I think we should celebrate with the understanding that just because someone professes faith and even goes through baptism doesn't mean that they actually know the Lord. We don't have to be so suspicious that we're like, aren't you glad such and such professed faith in Christ today? Well, I don't know. Oh, 
Give me 40 years and I'll tell you. No, we rejoice. Now, I'm going to say this lovingly. When I hear of scenarios where people talk about, we had 18 kids saved. And I say, hey, well, tell me about it. I mean, I want to hear what was preached. Well, the person told stories, and man, they really tugged at our hearts. And then they asked the kids if they wanted to go to hell, and if they didn't want to go to hell, raise their hands. And if they raise their hands, come forward. And I'm like, that doesn't sound anything like what the apostles preached, or what Jesus preached, more importantly. Oh, Daryl, you're just a, an, an Ichabod, you're an Ebenezer, you just killed you. No. This matters too much. I'm not worried about recording numbers for a book that gets reported. I'm concerned about whether those who profess faith in Jesus Christ actually know Him and can know if they know Him. Well, these 17 kids, yeah, 14 got saved at a church the week before according to those standards. It's not about being a killjoy, folks. It's about getting the most essential thing right you cannot afford to get this wrong so take seriously the importance of living for jesus and not just saying that you live for jesus because many people today claim to be christians according to statistics 75 percent of u.s citizens are christians the fact that you all didn't pass out makes me wonder if you're even listening i'm kidding do we look like a nation that consists of 75%? Three out of four people love Jesus, follow Jesus, preach Jesus. Uh, you don't have to be a preacher, but, but proclaim Jesus? No. There you go, being Mr. Negative again. It's reality. And that's what Paul is dealing with. Consider the conduct of your own life and the lives of those who profess Jesus and see if you look more like what he speaks of in verse 17 or what he speaks of in verse 19. Verse 17, join in me, join in imitating me, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. That's a godly way to live. Verse 19, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Which do you line up more with? And I know it's a painful reality. As a believer, there are times when I go and I read Galatians 5 and I read the deeds of the flesh and I know that that's not an exhaustive list because he says and things like these and I say, Lord, I'm seeing more of that than I'm seeing the fruit of the Spirit. This got to stop. This is me. This is on me. Okay. Finally, verses 20 and 21, the Christian necessity of remembering our present hope for the future, and it is a glorious future with Jesus. Look at verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. So in verse 20, Paul is contrasting the future home of unbelievers with the future home of believers. The unbeliever is going to have destruction. That's hell, folks. Yes, a literal hell. That's where unbelievers will go. But the believer has this hope. We have it right now. We just haven't realized it yet that we will be with the Lord in eternal peace, in His presence, never to be separated from Him in any sense at all. And we won't be strangers there. We won't feel as if someone invited us to the Thanksgiving meal out of pity and they don't really want us there. They're just trying to be kind and neighborly and they heard a sermon that said you should do that. One of the things that I love is that I'm, I'm seeing more and more people who are willing to open their homes and they're not just trying to be sympathetic or empathetic and saying yeah come on but no they're like no please come please come sit at the table see we're going to be invited there and there won't be any awkwardness of do you do you really want me here yes absolutely and you're never going to leave 
You're a citizen here. Well, what did I do to gain this citizenship? Nothing. <laughs> I gave it, and I won't take it back. What a promise. We will be at home with the Lord as citizens of His kingdom. Believers should have absolute confidence that Jesus is the Savior, and He is coming again for His people. And I remind you of the Apostle John as he is finishing the letter known as Revelation. There in chapter 22, verse 20, he has spoken about Jesus, bearing witness to the things that he's seen and written down. And he says, he says he's coming back. He says he's coming again. And John's response is, Amen. <laughs> Come, Lord Jesus. I cannot wait to behold you again. And that's our confidence too. Verse 21, whereas the false sheep will ultimately live forever in destruction, which again is hell, the believer by Jesus from these lowly bodies to new bodies that will be glorious like his own. And yes, that does mean that these aches and pains and things like those will be no more. And that's good. There'll be no more physical therapy and medicines and doctor's visits. That will be really good. But I think it's going to be so much more than just that. So much more. And Paul says, Jesus is going to do that by his own power. Well, how's he going to be able to do that, Paul? Because he's God. He's sovereign. He's eternal. He's all-powerful. But I thought that was true of the Father. It is. It's true of the Son. It's true of the Spirit. One God and three persons. He'll do it by His power, not by ours or anyone else's. Well, what do you think Rome's going to say? It doesn't matter what Rome says. They won't even have a voice. He doesn't need any help in accomplishing this. Not only does he not need help, but he doesn't need our approval. He's just going to do it. He's going to do this. And we're not going to be kicking and screaming along the way. We're going to be glad. But we're going to know you and only you did this. And you and only you get the glory for it. And we need to live like that now as well. And all things are subject to Him. And He wills to do this transformation for His people, but only for His people. And nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, will stop Him from doing these very things. Hallelujah. So live with present and future hope, even in a world so mired by sin and darkness. Don't be afraid to turn on the news, but don't be afraid to turn it off sometimes too. Don't be afraid to recognize that there's real heartache in this world, wars and disaster and ungodliness. These things aren't new. Those things were present in the days of Jesus, in the days of the apostles. They're present now. They're going to continue to, to be that way until Christ comes and makes it right. But we don't have to live in fear and just let's run and hide. But we don't have to pretend like there aren't real struggles. Now we're talking about a gospel confidence, a gospel joy that, that responds when people say, well, how is your God good and powerful when there's evil in the world? You know, Why hasn't your God done anything about evil? And we can say, are you kidding me? Let me tell you about a cross and, and, a, and one who hung on one. Let me tell you how God dealt with evil. We not only should be the most hopeful people on the planet, we need to be the most hopeful people on the planet. Again, not pretending like nothing is wrong. So there's that careful balance. We don't pretend like, you know, oh, everything's great. No, it's not. But we also don't walk around in sackcloth and ashes every day of our lives either. When there are things to sorrow over, we sorrow. And when there are things to rejoice over, we rejoice. And we do all of this presently in the hope of what's coming in the future. More, more realistically, or more rightly spoken, who is coming in the future. 
The people of the world need to see this in us as well. To my family in Christ, consider the believers who have shown us the way in following the Lord. But ultimately, give thanks to the Lord Jesus for making these people His own and empowering them to live godly lives and setting godly examples for others to follow. And I challenge you, I challenge myself, respond by taking today and pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus that Paul mentioned earlier in chapter 3. And when discouragement rises, remember who we are hoping in and for. When John the Baptist asked Jesus through some messengers, are you the one or should we look for someone else? And Jesus did a couple of miracles and then said, go tell John that the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached to all people. The sick are healed, that's in there too. And the assumption is, is that those messengers would have gone back and told John, and John's heart would have rejoiced, saying, that's what Isaiah said would happen. But you know what you don't read about John's story? That he got released from prison. God didn't take that away. Not only did not God get him out of prison, God allowed him to be murdered. But John is rejoicing today in the presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. So even when discouragement rises, you remember who is coming for us and no one will stop him from doing that. He is God and he keeps that promise. He's going to keep it. And he's going to keep it. And we're going to go home. And it's going to be right. And he's going to get the worship that he's always been due. And we're going to do it forever and ever and ever. Amen. Keep looking to Jesus. And any unbeliever who might be here or even watching online, whether you are a religious phony, did he just say that? Yes. Because you might be one. Or even an unashamed denier of God. Or someone who says, ah, I'm just neutral on it all. No, you're not. There is hope for you, but only in the one who came and gave his life on a cross paying a debt that he didn't owe for people who couldn't pay it. God the Son, whose name is Jesus, came into this world to save sinners. And he is going to come back for those whom he has saved someday. So what your application is, is this. Turn from your sins and trust in Jesus Christ to save you. And he will. He absolutely will. And now by His power, you can follow Him all the days of your life and live in present hope and joining with us, waiting for that day when Christ comes back to bring us home. That's all I've got. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your faithfulness. Lord, your promises are yes in Christ. I think that all of us in this room could readily recognize sins and shortcomings in our own lives. And Lord, we could do that to the point that we would think I'm no example. But the reality is, is that we can be godly examples. And that's not to minimize our sins. But that's to say that you're the God who forgives and restores. And as you're working on us, Lord, our love for sin should become less and less. So thank you for these reminders. And thank you for the promise that your son is coming for us someday. I pray for the lost one. That God, they will think on what has been preached. <clears throat> And they will hear that very good news that Jesus is the Lamb of God who gave His life to rescue ruined sinners and death couldn't hold Him. And someday He's coming back. God, You and You alone can give them eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive the Gospel. And we trust that You're going to do that because You are the God who saves. And we pray in Your glorious name. Amen. Amen. Stand with us.